Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, this is Orphan Last, a.k.a. Skylar Madison, and welcome to the OpenTunes News. As of the release of OpenTunes 1.2, I've received a number of complaints. As such, I have needed to have a rather lengthy disclaimer. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and narrate the entire disclaimer, otherwise, every single OpenTunes News video will have the first five minutes covering a five-minute long disclaimer, which would be boring. But I do expect people to read this, and if they wind up leaving me messages, Messages and such like that, expecting me to respond any way than the disclaimer states, then that's your fault if you didn't read it. I'm sorry. And for the first story of the day, it actually is kind of ironic that after an intro like that, I happen to need to apologize for this, basically. During the last two to three minutes of the OpenTunes News Raster Brush upgrade video, uh, I wound up saying some things in a way that came off as somewhat offensive and I'd just like to apologize for that. I still believe in everything that I said in that it was just the tone of frustration and it's not so much what I said, it's how I said it. It's the difference from saying, oh, thank you, to saying, THANK YOU! Those two statements are identical, but ultimately, they have a different emotional effect. So, everything I said in this particular video, I still agree with everything that I wound up saying, but I should have said it better. I should have said it more politely. And if anyone's offended, I am sorry about that. So the next story of the day is titled Fix Number Plus Letter File Name Save and Detection. So this pull request fixes a story that I covered just a short while ago. OpenTunes creates drawings with letters in name but doesn't reopen them. The person that brought this particular bug in OpenTunes to my attention was Darren T. And then soon afterwards, ironically, I wound up running into the problem myself. This pull request also fixes an issue where the My Paint icons wouldn't be showing. This pull request also fixes an issue where there would be a frame sequence import issue. This pull request also fixes this issue right here where the title of the story is Image Sequence Loads Multiple Times When Loaded from System File Manager. This pull request also fixes an issue where extra periods in name stops image from loading. So this is a really big story right here. This is big news. Really happy to report on this. This is where some serious bug fixing has been conducted. For the next story on the list, we have straight from Constantine himself from the Marevna Project stating the following. I have good news. Ivan, aka Black Warthog, is finished doing all of the required modifications to the architecture for the OpenTunes Assistant tool. Now he's implementing it into the interface as an assistant layer itself. The most problematic part is behind us now. He's also made a change to the architecture in a small way that allows to implement the extra feature that you requested initially, the mirroring tools. Also, the code has also been made public as well, so if you are able to find it there on GitHub, feel free to go ahead and look for it, but that's just a good little piece of news right there. After having discussed it with Constantine uh, afterwards, I mean, the conversation continues and all that, it's pretty safe to say that with the next OpenTunes Marevna edition, we are going to probably get the assistant tool in OpenTunes, or an assistant layer, uh, from what it sounds like. For the next story on the list, it's a story that comes from Behemoth, and he states the following. These are a list of actions that you can conduct inside of OpenTunes. Select a vector shape. Copy it by pressing Ctrl C. Move the time slider downward on the X sheet with the hotkey. Do not highlight the frame with the cursor while executing this task. Paste it by pressing Ctrl V. A new frame is created and a shape is inserted. Then undo it, this action by pressing Ctrl Z. The inserted form disappears and the frame 
does not. Press undo until the resulting frame disappears. It disappears when the elongated exposure of the first frame is cancelled. Now click on the redo button several times in the X sheet. The missing frame does not appear, and in the level strip, redo looks random. The results are different for the same action order. In one case, both forms return to their level strip cells, and in the other, they are both placed in the first cell. The only difference between these two GIFs is that in one, I made the circle line a little thicker before the described action. So let's go ahead and take a look at these GIFs so that you guys can go ahead and get a good understanding as to what it is that he's describing. And it sounds as though there are unpredictable behavior with the undo and redo actions, especially when you don't click onto the X sheet specifically, the specific cell, the specific frame on the X sheet or the timeline and so it causes some problems. What I'm actually surprised about with this story is that no one has actually furthered a discussion on this particular topic. And I tend to find that the discoveries that Behemoth finds about open tunes tend to be really subtle, but kind of ingenious in a lot of different ways. So those are my thoughts about this. I, I think that this is, uh, underrated, and uh, I think that people should uh, possibly uh, take a look at this. It's This story has existed since February 15th, 2018. So, again, I'm just surprised that in all that time, he's the only person that's talked about this. This next story is from Shun Iwasawa, titled Color Calibration Feature Using 3D Loot. Shun Iwasawa states the following... This feature was demanded by Studio Ghibli. It was in Toons Ghibli edition, but has been missing in Open Toons until now. This pull request will add a real-time color correction feature using three-dimensional lookup table 3D loot. By applying a 3D loot file, which is properly configured with the current display monitor, it will become possible to work on different color space such as DCI-P3. To use this feature, specify .3dl file in preference interface category and restart the software. It will correct colors displayed on the viewer, combo viewer, flipbook, color model, palette, and style editor. For now, it only accepts .3dl file format. It must follow the specifications written here. For now, only Windows versions can detect the current connected monitor. For other platforms, only one 3D loot file can be applied for any type of monitor. Even on Windows version, connecting multiple different monitors at the same time is not supported for now. It will only identify the first registered monitor. Please note, for now, using plastic deformation together with this feature causes display issues related to texture, I guess, that the deformed image is not shown under the camera stand mode. I'll fix it soon. So, this sounds really cool. Here's some images for it so far uh, while I read the rest of the post. In the right pane of the above example, a Sedona loot downloaded from here and added some header to satisfy specification written here was applied to the original view on the left. So I'm not really going to pretend as if I understand all of this, but it sounds like we're working towards getting some color correction uh, into open tunes, which sounds really cool. However, it seems like there's a lot of caveats and addendums. You have to have the right monitor. You can't have multiple monitors. Uh, it only uh, registers uh, as under one sort of file format. And so there are problems with it, but I do think that this is going to be worked out uh, over time. I think that uh, eventually this is going to be something kind of cool. Um, I'm just scrolling through here, and there's this image of a dog running through this grassy field, and 
such like that. And the grassy field and the trees and everything kind of almost have a lomography effect, which uh, was a really uh, cheap but really high quality film type back in the day. And it really had this strong yellow tint when it was dipped into chemicals to produce the film. I, I scroll down just a little bit more and we can see the same dog running through the same grassy field with the trees and bush and all that. And a different 3D loot filter appears to have been applied and it looks really nice. Uh, it really vibrant greens and blues and everything like that. Uh, scrolling down even further, very strong Im green image. So yeah, this looks really promising uh, so that you can kind of get the sort of lighting that you want or the, the type of mood that you want into your scenes uh, immediately. And uh, so you can possibly reuse variously different scenes or backgrounds that you've used and uh, be able to utilize different lighting uh, to uh, reflect a different type of mood for the scene and everything like that. So this looks really cool. Uh, it really does. I'm, I'm excited for this. For the next story on the list, it's titled Fix Undo of Move Styles written by Shun Iwasawa, and his OP states as follows. This pull request will fix the following problem, undo of move styles, by control, click, drag the style selection. In the palette, sometimes fails to restore the style order. So one of the minimum examples to reproduce the problem is as follows. Create palette with seven styles. Select style number two to style number five. Then click and drag them to the end. Step number two, undo the operation. Now I'm not really quite sure what is meant by undo the operation. Now, are we talking about pressing control Z and having that somehow apply to undoing what it is that you're doing with the style palette? Because if that's the case, I, I don't understand why control Z would be applied to this. I don't know. This is actually the first time I've ever even heard of this feature. It does interest me. The fact that I learned something about the program from this particular pull request is what's interesting me about this. Now, I since then tried control clicking and dragging styles around and had absolutely no success. Maybe this will fix it. Maybe I did it wrong. I have no idea. But there have been a number of comments in reply, but all of them have just been uh, pretty much Jenkins. Yeah, nothing substantial as a conversation here, but the story stands on its own as an interesting topic. And for the next story, we have modifications on Studio Palette Tree View. And once again, this is another story by Shun Iwasawa. Now, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the Studio Palette, I have used the Studio Palette just a little bit while using Open Tunes, and it was primarily when I was making my Punching Man animation. It allows you to be able to create a series of colors and keep it on a palette, save them, and then move them around from one scene, one project, to another, and from one level to another level, and such like that, so that you can make sure that if all these different people have the same skin tone, or if they all have the same hair color, or something like that, you can just move them from one level to another level, one scene to another scene, and such like that. It's a pretty useful and very powerful tool, but I just haven't used it that much. So the story reads as follows. This pull request will modify dragging behavior in the tree view of Studio Palette window as follows. Made a confirmation dialog to be opened before drag move palette inside the tree view in order to prevent unintended moving files by mistake. Since the Studio Palette is usually shared among studio staffs, I think it is reasonable to take users attention on modifying it. Drag an item and drop on another palette item will now cause moving the selected item to the same folder as such palette. Before this pull request, dropping another palette caused nothing, but the operation added a useless undo. Item order in the tree view is changed for simplicity. Now, all subfolder items are put above palette items. 
before this pull request, items were all mixed up and put in alphabetical order. This modification was requested by some Japanese animation studio. And actually, I, I really do appreciate that there's being some sort of attention put to the studio palette. Me personally, I, I really do, because in the short period of time that I used it, it was such a nightmare to use that I decided not, uh, not to really use it. So I am looking forward to being able to use whatever modifications are being used here. So this is cool. I'm, I'm really happy about it. Once again, we have a bit of a conversation going on here, but uh, once again, we have Jenkins, we have Jenkins again, we have Jenkins again, and LGTM and all that good stuff. So if you'd like to take a look at the story in the link in the video description below, feel free to do so. It's just don't expect there to be a really profound conversation going on. But, you know, in a way, this is applauds. People are applauding and... Uh, you know, Sean Iwasawa looks like they deserve it. For the next story, it's written by Behemoth, and the title reads as follows. Crash win switch to fill after converting Toon's raster area to vectors in outline mode. So there's a three-step process. Number one, draw something in Toon's raster level using paintbrush. Number two, convert to vectors outline mode. Number three, Select that vector level and switch to fill tool. And so evidently this will cause the program to crash every single time. So here you see him just kind of just making this outline, the raster level, into a vector and he tries to fill in what's there and it just crashes the computer. That's or crashes the program. So that that's crazy. However, one thing that I would like to mention that is a pretty good option to be able to quickly outline something like a silhouette kind of gets me thinking about variously different creative processes that I might be able to use something like that for. But even still, this, this seems like a pretty big problem. There is a little bit of a conversation going on on this particular story. However, it's not very long. If you'd like to weigh in, feel free to do so and all that good stuff. Let's go ahead and move on to the next bit. Next on the news is the Made with Open Tune segment. Now the first little bit is by AV Originals. The intro looked really good. Uh, this guy is capable of doing a few things that I'm not capable of doing such as uh, 3D animated material appears inside of this cartoon and I, I will say a few things that I, I do like and what I don't like. Uh, the sound effects tend to be spot on. The character expressions you can totally read them and such there are a few moments where the uh, the foreshortening is just a little bit off there is a moment where there's this child that's stuck underneath a log and the log doesn't seem like it'd be very threatening and yet the kid's life is in danger the audio does seem as though when it's a character dialogue it doesn't seem like it was recorded in a good setting you can actually hear their voice bouncing off the walls inside of a room and yet here they are out in the open wilderness and you can hear their voice bouncing off the walls of a room and there's this sensation of disillusionment whenever someone talks inside of this cartoon now regardless anybody who has made a five minute 30 second long animation in open tunes needs a round of applause i'm just giving a little bit of a critique and such like that and i by and large start to finish i'm excited when i see this cartoon i think it's really well done and i'm not going to show the entire thing uh here inside of this video because i don't think that would be fair but ultimately what i think you can do in order to make sure that the audio quality is better maybe it's the recording hardware maybe you need a better microphone um and if you're not really necessarily wanting to record all in the same location then maybe what you need is something like a digital voice recorder. Some of them come with a really nice built-in microphone, and this one seems like it is at something like $30 or something like that. Um, and it looks like it's uh, pretty good quality even. It looks like it has a microphone built into the bottom and on the top. And so this looks like it'd be really nice to have. Also, when you're recording, 
if you, if you're going to be recording indoors and you want to make sure that the audio doesn't bounce off the walls what you do is you just drape a bunch of blankets around the walls and that will prevent the vibrations of your voice from bouncing all over the place or you might want to mimic the exact same thing that's happening inside of your cartoon if your characters are out in the wilderness you might want to drive off towards some location that's a little bit more open out Doors and such like that not necessarily out in the wild but just outdoors but ultimately that was the the main thing that I, I have the biggest critique about it's just the the audio of the dialogue that's the the one criticism I have that if if you uh, were to somehow fix that down the road or improve on that in your next project I would be super excited for you and I, I'm only mentioning all of this just as uh, a person that enjoys watching cartoons. All that I am saying is that these are the things that I've noticed and I mentioned one thing that I think uh, would improve the watching experience. Now there is one other recording device. If you're thinking about recording all of your audio indoors and everything like that, if you want a good microphone, there is a Blue Snowball microphone for $49. This is a really good microphone. The Blue Yeti is also a good microphone as well. So uh, I actually am recording with the Blue microphone right now. So those are some options for you. Uh, of course, you know, the Blue Snowball is a lot less expensive than the Blue Yeti and all that. And you can get a pop filter and a stand with it for $74.99. But really, that's not necessarily needed. I got a pop filter that I put onto this weird little tripod stand for $15. And I'm pretty good with what, what I got right now. No complaints. So those are some options for you and all that good stuff. Now, I personally haven't really recorded much audio inside of my own cartoons or anything like that. And if I did, I would start draping blankets around me before recording. Uh, because I do recognize that my voice does sound like it's inside of a room inside of my videos. The next thing that's been made with Open Tunes is this animation that's kind of a Full Metal Alchemist uh, fan fiction sort of thing. It looks a bit like it's inspired by the artistic vision of something like The Last Airbender, kind of a hybrid between the two. Now I've covered this guy's work before in the past and I find everything that this guy's been working on, every time he posts one of his animations, it's just phenomenal. And I'm really glad that we have someone as talented as this using open tunes. Now, inside of the video description below, I have a link to his Facebook profile, also to this animation here on Facebook. Now, I, I believe, I hope I don't pronounce his name wrong, I believe his name is Taizan Bui. Okay, that's what I believe his name is. I, I, if I pronounced it totally wrong, then I do apologize. But So in this video, I've made sure to attach his name inside of the video description below as well. So everything's good. And uh, yeah, anyways guys, that pretty much concludes it for this video. If you guys enjoyed it, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you didn't like it, please like, share, and subscribe. Anyways, there's a lot of work that goes into making these videos. And if you'd like to take a look at any of my other videos, feel free to click on any of them that are appearing on the screen right now. Thank you very much for your time.